you teach people how to treat you through the way that you treat yourself. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we have an episode for you about setting boundaries, healing from people pleasing, perfectionism, and nurturing your relationship with yourself. Our guest today is Yasmin Cheyenne. Yasmin Cheyenne is a self healing educator, author, speaker, and mental wellness advocate who helps people learn how to cultivate daily practices to build healthy, joyful lives. With an online community of over 150K and as the host of the Sugar Jar podcast, corporate giants including ABC, Meta, and Skillshare have invited Yasmin to share her transformative teachings around self-healing, which she also offers through keynote speeches, corporate presentations, and one-on-one coaching. Yasmin's first book, The Sugar Jar, is currently available for pre-order and will show readers that when we nurture our energy, we can create more balance and joy in our lives. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly share about our new Artist of Life workbook. If you want an organized, guided system to achieve all your goals in 2023, check out the new 2023 Artist of Life workbook at shop.lavendaire.com. All right, on to the interview. Hello, Yasmin. How are you doing today? Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So why don't you start off by telling us your story and why you're passionate about self-healing and mental wellness? Yeah. You know, I think my story is a a lot like a lot of people's. We had no idea that we could choose what we want for our lives. You know, we thought that we had to do things a certain way. We should do what our family is saying. We should do what other people think we should be doing. And I got to a place in my life where I was like, this cannot be it. Like I can't, my life can't actually be me just doing what everybody else wants and not being able to show up for myself and do what feels good to me. And so I started my own healing journey um, after being a victim advocate in the Air Force. And I started, then I started teaching. And through my own journey and through teaching, I've recognized the consistent story uh, that's that's true for me, but true for the people that I work with too, that we don't often feel like we have permission. And so self-healing is so important to me because it's us giving ourselves permission to be or choose whatever we want for our lives, not allowing other people to dictate how we should be living. Yeah. Love that. Um, Give us a little more background on like who you were before you kind of had that like aha moment. Let's talk about the, the before and then the after. So before Yasmin, um, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I definitely bought into the hustle and bustle lifestyle, you know, be strong, move fast, who cares about feelings? And then I joined the military at 19 years old, which basically just reinforced all of that. Be strong, who cares about feelings, keep going. Um, And then in that military time, um, I was a young mom, I was married at the time, Um, and I was also a victim advocate, I just kept feeling this pull to to healing work because working with victims of domestic violence or trauma and things like that, I kept finding myself asking, like, what happens to them afterwards? How do they get out of this space and into a space that feels better for them after experiencing something that's so tough? And that made me realize, like, how do I get out of the space that I'm in and get to a place that feels better. So I would say me before I was very curious about the, I always was curious about the fact that this can't be the way life is. Like you can't tell me that like we grow up and then it's just crappy every day. And then we go to sleep. Like there has to be a way um, for us to be able to start to live a bit more in joy or peace. Me before just had no idea where to begin. And that was the thing. It was just like, okay, I don't know where to begin. Then I guess this is just what it is. And everyone around me was reinforcing that. Yeah. They were like, oh, that's just what life is. Life's just tough. And life is tough sometimes, but it doesn't have to be tough every day. And it definitely doesn't have to be where we never get to do what feels good to us too. So, Yeah, definitely. Um, talk about like what what sparked this change and what were like the key, I guess, mindset shifts that you had to make because it it is hard to shift when everyone around you is telling the same story, right? So, so what sparked this this major change and this like 
you know. For I just want to preface this by saying this took years, um, like over a decade and a half of of work on myself, and I'm still a work in progress. The shift for me definitely started when I was working with domestic violence victims. Um, holding space for people with that kind of trauma definitely made me feel like I need to go see my own therapist, get my own help to support me while I'm supporting them. I had no idea that while I was in therapy, I was going to realize that I wasn't happy in my whole my, in my own life. I had no idea I was unhappy. I thought that I mm-hmm. that this was just what life. You just was. accepted that as normal. Yeah, I was yeah. in therapy because of the victim advocacy stuff. Oh I didn't know this was going to open this whole new world for me. Yeah, and so through that experience, that's when I was like oh, I want to keep going. I want to find out more about myself. I want to uncover more. Yeah. So as you were healing yourself, did you find that you immediately started like helping the the victims? Like, like, was it, was there kind of like an immediate effect where you were like sharing this stuff or did it take some time before you decided, oh, this is what I want to share and this is my new direction? It definitely took time. At that point when I was in victim advocacy, I definitely took pieces of what I do today, but that was in the very beginning stages. So, you know, basically like if my job was just filling paperwork out with that person, I wasn't just doing that. I was asking them how they were doing. I was finding ways to get them financing. I was, you know, I always felt like there should be more that what should be done. And I always went above and beyond, but the emotional support, I didn't have that, those skills at that time to do that. Yeah. So, okay. So now you have this sugar jar concept. Can you explain what that is and what's the story behind how you came up with it? Yeah. So just to give uh, listeners a uh, background between the military and the sugar jar, I was still in that space of discovery, you know, like self-discovery, self-healing, um, yes, therapy, but also a lot of just internal dialogue with myself. Um, I started coaching and working with people in 2013 after getting a coaching certification. Um, and through working with clients, I de- developed my own way of coaching and helping them to self to begin practicing their own self-healing journeys. Because the number one thing that often keeps people from wanting to do any kind of healing work is I don't have the time. Where am I going to take something out to be able to put something else new in? Or I can't afford it at this time. So I wanted people to feel like whether they're working with me or if they're on their own, that they still can have these tools in their own lives. And so 2014, 2015, 2016, I'm consistently working with clients. 2017, I get pregnant. 2018, I give birth. And I've been working at this point for years, uh, teaching people how to heal, helping them with their journeys. And I find myself burnt out. I find myself exhausted. And I'm thinking to myself, like, first of all, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Like, this is what I teach for a living. Why am I struggling? You know, we have that sense of like being hard on ourselves and that shame. And I also felt like my life was I was getting a lot of the things I wanted in my life. My career was taking off. There was, you know, I had another baby. Like I, you know, loved my friend groups. Like everything was really great. I had already set all the boundaries. So like, why am I still struggling? And that's when I realized that that's when the sugar jar came to me. I was literally sitting at a table with my daughter who was a few, maybe a month and a half-ish old. Um, And I was like, I just feel like a glass of sugar in a kitchen And people are coming into the kitchen and they're taking out sugar. They're taking my energy. They're taking my time. They're taking all of these things and they're careless with it. And I feel like I can't even keep up. I can't even fill my sugar jar back up again before someone else is back in taking more stuff. And I think the realization again at that point was I need to put a lid on my jar. I need even more boundaries in place right now because I don't have what I need to care for myself. This was just the internal conversation that I was having with myself. I had no idea that it was going to morph into this whole thing, but it became such a great way for me to check in with myself that I started teaching it with my clients. And then it turned into the Sugar Jar podcast, the app and my book. So yeah. 
Oh, that's amazing. Okay. So it's funny that you thought you were already doing the work, setting good boundaries. And then you're like, no, I need to set even more boundaries. So, so what is your definition of healthy boundaries? Like, how do you figure out what that is? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I didn't realize at the time was that boundaries change. When your life changes, when circumstances change, it's okay to change your boundaries and shift what you need at that time. And so healthy boundaries are when you understand what you need and you're willing to advocate for it. If you need more time in the morning, you know, you're waking up earlier. If you need your partner to not, you know, to to respect a certain need, then advocating with them, communicating what you need. But In addition to communicating with the need or setting the boundary, also making sure that it happens. I think I had a lot of boundaries in place, but I wasn't saying, hey, remember we talked about this. That's not okay. Or, hey, remember we talked about this. I don't have time for that. I was still like, oh, we did talk about it, but I guess they're here, so they need it. And so I'm just Uh, letting them kind of take again. And I had just had a baby. So there was a lot of things that had shifted. And you know, I think there's a lot of people, whether you have a child or not, when you have an energy shift where you don't have as much to give, it takes a while for the people around you to catch up with the fact that this person who would normally just do what I asked, isn't willing to do it or can't do Mm -hmm. it anymore. You're going to have to be the person that says, you know, I love you, but I can't. And I think that that is what's hardest for people to understand about healthy boundaries yes, we want everyone around us to just love us and accept what we're changing. And yet that's not usually how it works. People are usually dragging, kicking and screaming like, no, I don't want you to change. I want you to keep doing what I want you to do. Um, And it's really, it can be really tough. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, on one hand, I just, I feel like if anybody has a baby, you expect that they don't have time anymore. You know, I think when energy shifts and your time shifts, like say you get a new job or you have a baby, I think it's just a learning experience for yourself and everyone around you too. Like what Mm -hmm. is the new normal? And I think that's something that people don't, they're not aware of like, oh, if there's a shift, my boundaries and my needs will change. So I have to be, be aware of it. I think people just think everything will stay the same. Um, Another thing you mentioned was how, even though you communicated the boundary, people still like somehow it still gets crossed and and ultimately it's, it's both parties, right? It's people asking, it's also you allowing it to happen. So, so talk about what happened there. And, and any advice for listeners who, who do that really often, like they try to set a boundary, but it doesn't work. This is the toughest part, I think, because, um, when we start healing, I think this is where sometimes our relationships don't last or we end up losing certain people because we keep saying, Hey, this is what I need from you, or this is what's not okay. Like, for example, I think something that a lot of us have dealt with is a friend or family member who thinks it's funny to call out certain things or make certain jokes that are inappropriate or make certain comments that are inappropriate. And we've said, I know you think that's funny. I know you think it's not a big deal, but it actually really bothers me. Can you not do that? When we say that, that's the boundary, Mm -hmm. right? The, The other thing to keep in mind is that we're giving them an option. Boundaries are always an option. They're not ultimatums. They're not, you must do what I say if you want to be in my life. They're, I need you to hear that this is important to me. Will you respect what I'm asking you? And people have an option to say, yes, I will respect what you're asking. Or yes, I'll respect it, but I need a compromise because that doesn't actually work for me. Or no, I don't care about what you're saying and I'm going to do what I want to do. And when we get into that last category, for sure, I think that's where we have to ask ourselves, what do I need to create in this relationship to feel safe? Can I stay in relationship with them? Do I only want to be around them when we're in groups? You know, for a lot of people, especially Mm -hmm. with certain family members, we're like, Mm -hmm. I'll see you when the whole family's around, but I'm not doing one-on-one with this family member because, you know, I have past experience that it hasn't worked out well, or I end up in stressful situations with them. So just becoming curious with yourself about in what ways am I overgiving in this relationship or am I confident or am I um, saying yes to connecting with them or being in spaces with them when I know that it's draining me. And I'm not saying that every single person around you is going to respect every single boundary you have, and then you're going to live a perfect life and never have an issue again. Like that's not reality. But I'm also saying that 
the primary responsibility is on you to ensure that you are advocating for what you need. And that's the toughest part because we just wish people would just behave (laughs) and just not, you know, say or do things. And, you know, these are the more harmful boundaries. Sometimes the boundary is just, you know, it's not as harmful. Sometimes it's like, I'm not going to answer my phone after eight o'clock because I want to go to bed early because I want to wake up early and have a good, you know, I want to go for a run. Stop, stop answering your phone at, at night. You know, sometimes it's on us to respect our own boundaries and realize I'm not the one doing what I said, right? Yes. Yeah. I call that like keeping the promises you make to yourself Uh, Mm because that builds trust with yourself. That's another whole other topic because if you don't, if you can't even respect your own boundaries that you set for yourself, how do you expect other people to start to respect your boundaries? Um, and, And the way I see boundaries, like, you can't really control what other people decide to do. Like, yes, you can communicate, but sometimes like all you can only control yourself. So focus more on that part than, than forcing other people to behave how you want them to behave. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, I call them self boundaries. The way that we treat ourselves is often mirrored in the way that we're in relationships. And a lot of us are doing it because we don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to make people upset. We don't want to lose relationships. We're afraid of what people are going to think about us if we say what we really you know, want or need. Um, but the other side of that is, am I willing to be uncomfortable or unhappy or unsafe just mm-hmm. to not ruffle people's feathers? It's like, we really have to start to ask ourselves, how can I care about their feelings, but care about myself too? And that's what Boundaries is doing, is allowing us to say what we need and also let them know what works for us at the same time. Yeah. Let's go a little bit deeper into like the people-pleasing tendencies and how to heal from those. Because you know that that part of you that says, oh, I don't want to ruffle people's feathers. I don't want people to feel bad, hurt people's feelings or blah, blah, blah. Like where does that come from in your perspective? And how do you, how have you healed from that in your life? Like what has that process been? Yeah. You know, I don't really identify myself as a, a recovering people pleaser. I'm definitely way more of a recovering perfectionist. Uh, um, but for people who struggle with people pleasing, um, it usually, it can come from many different places, but the, the place that I see it the most is it's a learned behavior from when we were children. You know, we were taught early, early on that if you want to be a good girl, if you want to be a good boy, if you want to be seen as a good person, this is what you should do. You should do what I say. You should, you know, behave. You should not speak when other people are speaking. You should give money even if you don't want to, you know, and it comes from that validation. When we do the good thing, the good thing, then the person says, that makes me so happy for lack of a better you know, term of mm-hmm. what they say. They say, that makes me so happy. And then you feel good for making them happy. And it creates this cycle and we go into another relationship and we are looking again in all of our relationships for that validation that we are good because good has now translated to I'm safe. They love me. They need me. And we continue that cycle until, you know, and some people are st- continue it for life. But for those of us who go, go into healing, we realize I don't have as much to give as I'm showing I have to give. I don't have as much to give as I'm sharing. And this is the hard part for people pleasers is that when they say no, a lot of those relationships end because the relationship was literally built on the fact that you were going to give and they were going to be able to get whatever they want without having to give to you. And I think that's the hardest thing for recovering people pleasers is learning that the people in their lives, they may care about them, but the relationship was built on their overgiving. It was never built on the mutual love and respect they thought they had. Yes. Mm -hmm. The reciprocity was never there. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, and, and learning those new ways of being in relationship and finding those new relationships or reforming old relationships to have a more equal balance is a forever thing. I, I always like to tell people, like, there is no such thing necessarily as I've done that lesson, I'm healed, I'm moving on. It's like, yes, you may heal certain things and you may also have to revisit them later on. You know, we're on this healing journey for life as we meet different people and we have different experiences. So 
being compassionate to ourselves as we may have to revisit old things that we thought we went through, like I did with the boundaries. You know, when the sugar dry came to me, that was something that I thought I had dealt with and that came came up again. All right, let's take a break for today's sponsor, Apostrophe. The holiday season is around the corner and with it comes gift giving, good food, and of course, holiday portraits. I've taken my fair share of bad photos, like when there's a giant zit on my face that even makeup can't cover. So while we can't control other aspects of the holidays, we can make sure you feel confident for your photos. Apostrophe's goal is to help you feel confident in your own skin. Whether dealing with breakouts, signs of aging, or acne scarring, Apostrophe will help you love the skin you're in. Apostrophe connects you with an expert dermatologist team to get customized acne treatments for your unique skin. Simply fill out an online consultation, snap a couple of selfies, and a board-certified dermatologist will create your first customized treatment plan with access to oral and topical medications. The package also comes with some cute stickers to personalize your bottle. We have a special deal for our audience. Get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash TLL when you use our code TLL. That's a savings of $15. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash TLL and click begin visit. Then use our code TLL at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. I see healing as like a spiral. Like it, you'll always go back to the same themes, but like say you heal it, but you'll come back. It'll, it'll be a new angle. It'll be a, like healing it in a different way or in some, something like that. Um, you also mentioned you dealt with mainly perfectionism. So can you explain that and how that relates to boundaries? Perfectionism is different um, than people pleasing. People pleasers sometimes may be perfectionists, and perfectionists may sometimes be people pleasers too. But perfectionism is often everything has to go right. There is no room. There is no no room for mistakes. Um, I have to do everything right. And the big thing with perfectionism is when something doesn't go right, which is bound to happen, right? Because we're human. Um, it's the self blame and the self the way where perfectionists beat themselves up for not being perfect. Because in the same way as people pleasers, the validation that has come from being the person that's always strong, being the person that can always be relied on, being the person that always gets it right, they're less likely to ask for help. They're less likely to ask other people um, for support or even know how to receive support. Um, And they're also more likely to tell other people how they should be doing things. And so people are like, I don't even want to help you because you're a lot (laughs) um, (laughs) when you're trying to help. And so they're like, I keep telling you that you'd say you want to help me. I'm telling you what I need. And, you know, they don't even understand the way that it may be coming off sometimes. And I think that um, for recovering perfectionists. And when it comes to, to, to boundaries, it's one for sure, learning how to control what they say yes to first and foremost, like, do I actually have the space and time for this? Then the second part is, can I actually handle this all by myself or do I need help? And if I need help, am I willing to allow that help in the way that they are willing to come in and support me? Not by like being the manager, leader, dictator over what everyone is doing and saying, And for all of these people, for all of us who, no matter whether you're recovering perfectionist, people pleaser, whether you're in a place of codependency, whatever it is that you're dealing with, learning to have compassion for yourself is the ultimate thing that we're all working on. We're all in this space of participating in these cycles that we've learned through whether whether it's been through childhood, adult friendships, romantic relationships, where we're playing out these projections and we're playing out these roles because we want to be loved, seen, and respected, and safe. And the way to being in relationships where we are loved, seen, respected, and safe is through communicating what we need and having healthy relationships, healthy boundaries, not through these cycles, but we're unlearning all of those behaviors and trying to put on, we're putting in these new tools and new way of being that, again, I say this all the time, but like takes a lot of time um, I always say I'm a work in progress because although I'm way far along this from where I was, I don't know what's coming. I don't know, you know, I'm raising yeah. children. There's all kinds of different things that will impact the way that I deal um, with the things that come my way in life. And having that 
capacity to acknowledge our humanness is so, such a big part of the work. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like in a healthy relationship, like I, my, I have a question about what if like two people's boundaries don't align? <laughs> like, like, have you seen cases like that? How do you kind of resolve that? That's such a good question because that's like the most, I think the most common thing that comes up with, with boundaries, especially, um, you know, let's say like you're in a lot of unhealthy relationships and you do a lot of healing work, you get out of those relationships and now you're in a healthy relationship and you're like, oh, this should be easy. And then it's like, no, it'll be healthier. But like, now we have both of our boundaries to contend yeah. with. Yeah. Now we both have healthy communication. Now we both, you know, compromise. And, and I think that's why it's important to recognize that boundaries aren't ultimatums. There are things that are absolutely off the table, right? There are certain things where you're like, that joke's inappropriate. Don't make that joke around me. There's no real compromise here. Like, I don't want to hear the joke. Or if you make the joke, then perhaps we won't be in each other's company. If somebody wants to compromise on that, that's not, that doesn't sound like a healthy uh, mm -hmm. relationship communication. But also realizing when you're having this compromise conversation that your boundary isn't up for debate, we're trying to find a way to meet in the middle where we're both understood. If, if this is a romantic relationship you're talking about, for example, we're looking at each other and saying, hey, we're on the same team. We love each other. We support each other. But this is what I need. And the other person might be saying, hey, this is what I need. And we're trying to find a way that we can meet in the middle and both feel safe on either side, but also honor that we may need different things. Um, and sometimes those boundaries don't come to a place where we can have complete middle ground meeting. Um, I'd love to hear the example, if you have one, of the type of boundary uh, that you're talking about. So I don't throw something out there that throws the listeners off. Um, <laughs> if it's a romantic relationship or friendship, but... Okay, this is really specific. I can think of a couple examples between me and my boyfriend where... Okay, we're both working on healing and we both kind of know each other's buttons. And sometimes, like, there are certain things I'm like, don't do that because that, like, it, it triggers me. And he's like, I know, he, he, he's like annoying in a way. He's like, because it triggers you, I want to encourage you to heal. So I'm going to push that button. But like, like he's like he's saying it in a way that he's like, I, and I, from the pers, I can take it from the perspective, like, it's annoying or frustrating. And, and at the same time, I can be thankful. Like, yes, you're bringing it up so I can heal from it. But but it's also very annoying. Like, do I feel safe when you do that? Not necessarily. <laughs> but it's. Mm -hmm. But he's like, I'm still going to do it because I, like, I don't know. Maybe he's being too pushy, but that is a boundary. You know, like, if I'm not ready to no, heal yeah, from you it. Made, that was a clear like, boundary. Yeah. Right, right. And so, so something like that, where he's like, he believes in a relationship. Like, he, he I don't know. He's like, oh, I'm helping you. But it could be that I'm not ready to be helped <laughs> in that area. And it could be vice versa too, where like I'm trying to help him and he's not ready to be helped. That's his, his boundary is like, no, don't, don't make me do that. Right? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is like, yes, you're my boyfriend and you're trying to support me, but you're not my therapist. I didn't hire you to be my coach. You know what I mean? Like, and I think reminding, you know, um, this is not for you necessarily. I'm not coaching you, but like for the listeners, like if you're in a situation like this, it's like reminding your partner or your friend or your family member that like, I appreciate you trying to support me. But like, if I ask you to not do this particular thing because it's triggering to me, I'm asking you this because it makes me not feel safe. And when I don't feel safe, I don't feel supported by you. And when I don't feel supported by you, it changes the way I show up in relationship with you. And so, although you may think you're trying to help me by triggering me, it's actually doing the complete opposite because I didn't, when we're in therapy or in coaching or something like that, we're in a safe space where we understand that we might be bringing up topics or conversations, or even if we're with friends or family and we're in that space where we set that, like, we're going to have this kind of conversation. We said yes to that. When someone triggers us, we have not said yes yeah. to that. That is coming from some place that we did not know was coming from. And so it's not helpful. It's creating a situation where I'm reliving something that's painful. And so I think it's important to let people know when they continue to do something that you've asked them not to do, especially when they think that it's helpful, that it's actually 
yes, I might be working on this thing that you think is helpful for me, but you're actually causing uh, distance in our relationship because, <laughs> or you could be, you're, you're causing uh, discomfort in our relationship because it keeps coming up. There's nothing more loving that we can do than respecting someone's boundaries. Yeah. And I think what my example kind of goes both ways because it also reminds me that like you, you, no matter how much you want to help someone and no matter how much you want to like guide them and encourage them to change, like you can't until they're ready and willing to change, right? Like there have been times where like I like I may nag at him a little too much for like, oh, drink more water. Ex- you should go exercise. Like, I don't know, like, all these things where like, but his boundaries, like I don't want to drink more water. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. I think it's so brave of you to bring this up because I think so many people are dealing with this in their relationships and just no one talks about it. Every, you know, everybody, yeah, yeah. you know, There's like different, everybody's I, I feel like it's so common, like people mm-hmm. wanting to change each other, like it with good intentions um, and they think they're helping them. But if that person doesn't want to be helped, it's, you just got to be patient and, and let them do live their life until they're ready. Absolutely. Even when we're in partnership with people or in friendships with people, we're not in control of what they decide to do for themselves. And by the way, when we take on other people's work, it could be, it, 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 we're creating, we're literally overstepping a boundary. When we take on other people's work, we're saying, I have a better idea of how you should be living your life than you do. And mm-hmm. I know that can be hard sometimes because we're talking about things that are very light, but sometimes somebody might be dealing with alcoholism or something that's harmful. And we really feel like, I want you to do this. You need to change. And even in those situations, we still have to allow people, people have to be ready. People have to want to do the things themselves or we're creating more discomfort and more uh, we're overstepping their boundaries or perhaps even participating in codependency in the way that we're in the relationship, thinking that, you know, we can create the change for them versus them doing it themselves. Yeah. All right. So another question I want to ask is what is like a common mistake people make when trying to set boundaries? Like give us the boundaries 101. Like how do we set good boundaries? <laughs> the the common mistake is literally what we just talked about. Okay. <laughs> the number one thing that people do when they're trying to set boundaries is I'm going to change everyone around me. Oh, like mm-hmm. now that I have boundaries, they're going to do what I want and they're going to do what I need. And we're thinking like external, my yeah. world is going to change versus boundaries are about you. They're not necessarily, yes, people need to respect your boundaries, but the number one thing that boundaries are doing are keeping you safe. And so it doesn't mean that because you set a boundary that like your mom isn't going to say inappropriate comments at dinner anymore. Like that's, you don't get to change how your mom shows up. You get to change how you react and what you allow and what you say yes to and whether you go to the dinner that she's going to be inappropriate at. That's what changes when you set the boundary. Um, I also think another thing that comes up when we set boundaries or the common thing that we think is going to happen when we set boundaries is that we are unaware of how lonely that work is. And what I mean by that is when we start healing and we start setting boundaries, it can be really isolating. For a lot of us, we can lose a lot of relationships or things change swiftly. People leave, people stop showing up in the same ways. And so I'm not saying this to scare anyone, but I think it's always important to know that for those of us who have relationships where there aren't a lot of boundaries, they really begin to change when we start saying no. And it can be really just overwhelming at how our world and life changes. And I always tell clients, it changes for the better. We have more time for the people who love us. We have more time for the people who are committed to us. We do have less drama in our lives. Like those things do show up, but, and also it can be a little alarming at how our lives and our relationships change when we say yes to ourselves. Before we go on, let's take a moment to hear about our sponsor, Clinique. I always appreciate when a product is clinically tested to be effective, which is why I'm excited to partner with Clinique. Meet Clinique's first foundation designed to be the last step in your skincare routine. 
Even Better Clinical Serum Foundation is formulated with three serum technologies that visibly reduce dark spots, brighten, and hydrate the skin. I love the amount of coverage it gives as well as the skincare benefits you get from this. Foundation doesn't do it justice. This is a clinical foundation built with three serum technologies and it even gives UV protection. Available in 42 shades, this hydrating foundation formula provides buildable, medium to full coverage with a satin finish. In as little as eight weeks, skin appears more even toned, radiant, and smoother even after makeup is removed. Plus, the glass bottle is recyclable with its more sustainable packaging. Don't call it makeup. This is skincare in just your shade. Find your shade this holiday season at Clinique.com. I mean, ultimately, you're creating a better foundation for your life. And although it can get lonely, it's like, if you feel lonely, work on loving yourself. Cause like a boundary, setting boundaries is learning to love yourself better. And I, I just feel like you have to feel whole and like loved by yourself on your own and set those boundaries. And then, you know, like everything else will be healthier in your life, the relationships, your, how you spend your time. Yeah. And it's important too. Yes, it's it's definitely important to love yourself, but also the loneliness piece that I brought up is because, you know, we're not healing so that we can do life alone. We're healing so that we have better connections, better com- community, better partnerships. And so it can be jarring to recognize that, you know, I, every almost every single client I've had it, um, has said at some point, I feel like I'm starting from scratch. This is just something that happens when yeah. we, you know, we begin to, to, to choose ourselves. And so knowing that, yes, loving yourself is important. Choosing yourself is important. And also you can connect and meet community on the other side of like having this new healing journey. And if you've been on the healing journey for a while, I know, you know what I'm talking about where you're in that place of like, oh my gosh, I've just lost like all of these people that I thought would be here forever. Um, and maybe you're in the place where you've met those connections and made those friendships, but it's, it's, it can, it can just be a hard part of the journey that, um, we go through, especially, uh, the younger folks, uh, the Saturn return. I don't know if you're into Mm -hmm. astrology, but like, yeah. 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 I mean, just think of it as like transformation time. You're literally like going to be a butterfly after this, (laughs) but you're going to have to go through some, some stuff. Another side of this coin is some people don't even know what they need, right? So what's your advice for how to better tune into yourself and figure out what you need, what you want? Love this question. Um, I think the first place to start is where am I uncomfortable? I think we often think about what we want to add you know, like when people say, I want to get my life together, I'm going to start going to yoga and I'm going to start doing this. Like those are things we're adding. What are you already uncomfortable with? What do you already need? Do you already feel like you don't get enough sleep? Are you barely having one meal a day? Do you not drink water? Do you feel like you don't even get to see the people that you love spending time with? Um, You know, those things. And how can we begin to say, okay, you know, actually something that I really like is I want to make more time for my friends. I want to, you know, go for walks with my partner. I don't want to be on the computer all day. Or if I have to be at work and on the computer all day, I want to actually take my lunch and not work from my desk. These sound like very small things that if you think about if you, before you healed, these were things that maybe you didn't have access to. I know for me, I ate at my desk every day. I barely saw the sun. I barely had any water. I barely had time for myself because I was just doing, 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 doing. And so imagining a time or a space where I would have some time for me, that sounded completely impossible. And so starting with the very small things that are actually very big things and the big scheme helps us to be able to start to create that change and begin to understand what we need. Mm-hmm. Um, because unfortunately, no one's going to tell us. No one's going to say, hey, yeah. don't you think you need some more Nobody of this? Will. No, it, they're just going to take from you. <laughs> so you have to decide what you take. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. So start with where you're already feeling uncomfortable. And then, and then the little things, like what would you like to add in your life? And then go to adding things. And maybe not even adding anything. I think people often say, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to join a gym. I'm going to do yoga. There's nothing wrong with a gym. There's nothing wrong with yoga. There's nothing wrong with eating healthy. But like, we automatically think about those things instead of thinking about, like, I don't 
see the sun all day or I don't have space to be with my friends or I don't go to sleep till 1 a.m. because, you know, I can't shut off my brain. Like those are the things that I think will help us in the when we're starting this journey. Yeah. Okay. Um so so on this healing journey, I know you talked about like therapy and some people feel like they can't afford healing practices, but I like what is your perspective on that? Like what are the things that our listeners can start to do like without paying to see a therapist? Like what are some practices that you would recommend to start with? I always think it's important to start with the free things um, before we invest, because when we start with the free things, we begin. I mean, let me preface this by saying, if you feel like you are struggling uh, with your mental health, if you feel like you're struggling with anxiety or depression or things like that, you know, please go find a therapist, um, find someone that maybe is within your insurance. If you don't have insurance, looking at programs like BetterHelp or things like that, that might have affordable therapy um, in your area is where you should begin. But for folks who maybe don't feel like they're ready for therapy or that, you know, they're not interested in starting on that path, the free things, um, like for example, I know my app, I offer tons of free things on my app. I'm not the only person with the app. There's so many apps out there that offer free journal prompts, podcasts, like mm-hmm. yours that yeah. allow people to come on and hear from experts. There's so many ways, like you could be listening to this episode and driving, or you could be listening to this episode and writing a couple things down um, and journaling about what you heard. There's so many ways to begin to think about or hear the information. The next step is once I hear this podcast episode, what steps do I take in my own life? And I think that's the thing that people need the most help with and why sometimes people hire someone. Now, if you can't hire someone, you can hear what we're talking about in this episode and start taking those steps. And maybe your first step is just doing the thing we just talked about. Where am I already uncomfortable? That's a huge step. You know, that's like prioritizing yourself by asking yourself that question. So I just want to just share one more time. Like if you're not able to start therapy for whatever reason, you're not ready. Podcasts, the Instagram people like myself and so many others who share posts every day, this podcast, you know, like there's so many ways that you can start your work by just listening to the free things that are available and then taking action on the things that we talk about in these episodes or on Instagram. It's not going to change by just listening to the podcast. You have to then take the step and do. Yes. Love that. Love that. Okay. So you mentioned your app, the sugar jar app. So why don't you explain like, what is it, what's included and why we should check it out? Yeah. You know, the sugar jar community app I created because I knew that Instagram was not enough. I I needed to go beyond that. If I wanted to really allow people to get connected uh, to themselves in the work on the app, I have audio workshops and video workshops, but on the free level, I have affirmations, journal prompts, um, things that really get people connected to themselves. And sometimes that's where it begins, just mm-hmm. in the writing or listening to an affirmation or listening to a, a audio workshop or something like that. People begin to understand, oh, this isn't working for me or this relationship isn't working for me or you know whatever. Like the thing that you shared um, earlier in your relationship, like Some people wouldn't even know what triggered means. Like people have no idea when they're starting from the beginning. So like it just helps you begin to get the language and the framework so that you can have these conversations without feeling like I don't know how to advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what the Sugar Jar community app helps people do. Love that. Love that you, I I feel like what we do is similar because I love, like I can only talk about myself and what I've learned, but I I really like to help give journal prompts because I, it's important for people to like take it home and do the homework themselves because everyone's life, everyone's issues are different, right? Like that's why I have like, I come out with workbooks and and worksheets because it's, it, like, you know, I can give you the prompt, but everybody's ha- going to have a different response and they're going to learn something different about themselves. So it, it's it's so personalized. And that's why it's hard to give like a one size fit all sort of thing. And literally that's why therapy is good because it's like you need to have some something one-on-one. It's so true. We're all unique in the way that we uh, see the world. And like, even when I was when I was writing my book, I knew that I couldn't just do chapters without journal prompts. I knew that it had to be something where people are able to take action because people 
people and myself, I am included in people. (laughs) I will read a book and just say, wow, that was such a good book. And then just like go on about my life. And I want people to like have that stopping point of like, no, what am I going to do about that chapter? I just read where I thought about all those things. Uh, I want you to take stuff away from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good reminder. I mean, I'm sure like I do that. I'm sure everyone does that as well, where they like watch a video. It's so inspiring. And then they, they just go on with their life. Um, but yeah, like actually taking the time to like integrate it in your life, ask, ask yourself the questions daily, you know, everything in life is actually like an opportunity to self-reflect, like literally any, you can do that with anything, right? I want to ask you about your personal routine. Like, do you have any rituals for self-care and and mental wellness? Yes. So personally, um, I get up early in the morning so that I can write um, I write every single day. It's what kind a of writing practice that it? I, so I do writing for myself, like just free form writing. Yeah. Um, and then I also write for like what I share on Instagram. Um, and I started it in 2017 as a way to just get everything out of my mind and onto the page, um, before I even start my day. So that really helps me to just feel like, okay, I got everything out. Um, and I used to journal in the evening, Mm. but I found that my journaling in the evening would be very much complaining about my day versus, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) you know, when you mean fresh day, it's like, oh, you know, you have a different perspective. (laughs) So it was really helpful. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I also take a walk, um, in the afternoon, like three or so times a, uh, a week. And this is something that, again, I did this even when I had a nine to five. I would take my 15 minute break and I would go for a walk. Um, It helps me to just connect to myself again. Um, I don't, I mean, you would think that we automatically think like, yeah, we need to have time outside, but then so many of us don't get time outside or don't get time to just take a break. That's something that I do every day. And then also tea. Mm. Tea is a way I, I take care of myself. I like take a lot of time to make elaborate teas that are specific to like, not necessarily like sweet teas or teas that are like super, my tea, I think my teas taste good, but I'm just saying they're like, oh, I need lemon balm because, you know, my nervous, I've been feeling a little anxious or I'm going to have some Tulsi because I have a, I had a stressful night last night. Like I'm, I'm making my tea based on what my body's experiencing. And that's felt like a really great way to take care of myself too. Oh, that's really interesting. Where did you learn like what go what's good for what? Like how did you start your tea journey? <laughs> I would say probably uh wow, feel, feeling old. Like in 2015, I started um really uh getting curious about how herbs could impact our bodies. And 2015 was probably my biggest year of anxiety. Um, and so I started thinking about ways that I could support my body with just what I eat and drink on a normal basis. And that's how I started learning about the teas. Yeah. I love that. Are there any like resources, people you follow that where people can learn more about that? There are so many books. Um, I will for sure make sure that I send you, I will email after this so that I can send because there's a book that came to mind and I can't remember it. I don't want to say the wrong one. So Okay. Yeah, definitely. So we can put that in the show notes because that's something I'm interested in. Like I haven't really dived into learning about herbs, but like, I just, I love that concept of like, it it is what you put in your body that can help give you what you need. I remembered it. Okay. Um, one of my good resources is organic Olivia. Have you heard of her? No. Her at on Instagram is organic Olivia, but she sells These teas are already made, so you don't have to buy all the solo teas, but her teas are made based on what I'm talking about. She has tinctures, all kinds of cool stuff, but it's all about supporting your nervous system. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Another question I do have for you was like, what was the most difficult part of your healing journey, whether it's setting boundaries or something else? And and how did you overcome it? I think the most difficult part of my healing journey was recognizing that some of the people that I love weren't going to come with me on the journey. Like, yes, I'm healing. Yes, I'm changing. Yes, I'm growing. And what happens when I'm not okay with certain things anymore and then the people around me are still okay with it? So then we don't do the same things anymore. We don't hang out in the same ways or they don't feel like they connect to me. They feel like I've changed and I have changed, but that, that was a really hard transition. Um, 
if you happen to be in a relationship, like romantic relationship or friendships where everyone's healing, like, oh my gosh, makes it a lot easier. They understand the language you're talking about. But if you're in a relationship, like, like not a relationship, but relationships community, like for myself, I was the only person going to therapy. Everybody was like, what are you talking about? What do you yeah. mean triggered? What do you yeah. mean boundaries? This sounds selfish. Mm. And so there definitely was, when you have that being reflected onto you, it can be harder to stay in the journey and feel like you, you, there's so much guilt you carry. Mm-hmm. And I had to learn not to carry that guilt and to let that go and not bring their projections on. But that's that was a long, long, uh, painful process. Wow. Yeah, that is difficult. Like if you're the only one that understands these concepts and everyone else, they're, they're essentially living in a different framework. Like in their world, they have different definitions. I also see it in terms of energy, right? Like if some people, they're, if they haven't even started a healing journey, their energy is at a certain level. And you're, as you release things, I feel like your energy becomes lighter. And so like you no longer resonate with the people that you used to resonate with before you started it's healing. It's so true. Right? And it's, it's it so is true. sad, but at the same time, you know, you're evolving. And, you know, if the people around you, if the energy is not the same, like you're, you're going to grow distant. Like I think that's just how mm. life is. It is. Um, and that's where, you know, some of that loneliness can come in or even grief. Um, you know, yes, in one way that you're choosing yourself and that's great. And you're moving, moving in another direction. And then also recognizing that there's a ton of grief that can come up with loss. And so dealing with that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So do you, if you were to leave the listeners with like one insight, like one message you want to share, what would that be today? You teach people how to treat you through the way that you treat yourself. I think that's the most important thing that we can remember on our healing journeys. You know, when we treat ourselves with respect, when we learn how to love ourselves, when we learn how to be compassionate, when we learn how to care for ourselves, we're less likely to say yes to stuff that will be harmful, that will drain us. Um, and that's why I call it self-healing. It's not because we're doing it alone. It's about healing the relationship that we have to ourselves because we so often think it's about everyone around us. And really many, many, many times is about the way that we are relating to us. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. So beautiful. All right, Yasmin, where can we find you online? You can find me on Instagram at Yasmin Cheyenne. Uh, My book is available for pre-order, The Sugar Jar. So you can order that. Um, And yeah, that's where you can find me. Amazing. Everyone, make sure you check out Yasmin Cheyenne. We'll have everything in the show notes below. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was wonderful. 